Welcome, everybody. I've got you for the next hour. Thanks for coming out. Um, my name is Tom Fuller. I'm an enterprise solution architect out of Atlanta. I've been with AWS for 18 months. So I've been working with a lot of different customers. First thing I kind of want to mention here is this talks about moving to AWS. But for any of you in the audience that are wondering, would it apply to me if I've already got stuff running in AWS? Is this just a migration talk? It's, it's really across the board. It's across the board, and we'll, we'll really focus in on, on these key things. So my background, too, before I came onto AWS is I did six years at Microsoft. I spent time in support. Um, I'm a developer by trade, so I've been slinging if statements and for loops for 15 years. But when I moved into support and then ultimately into the cloud platform on the Microsoft side, uh, there's lots to understand about administering and managing and operating different solutions of all kinds of different technologies, but clearly focused in the Windows-specific category. Um, now, at AWS, right, there, there's, this, there's this huge kind of explosion about uh, DevOps. Um, lots of different technologies, lots of different services. So the first thing I'm going to attempt to do is at least baseline on the roles and responsibilities that you should be seeing or things that likely you will be doing if you're in one of those kinds of roles in your organization. Um, and, and I work with predominantly enterprise customers, large enterprise customers. But I think hopefully you've seen this with a lot of the sessions you've seen already this week. When we get up here on stage and talk to you all, we talk about real scenarios where customers are leveraging these services and things they've learned. So one of my activities to prepare this session was not only just my own customers I work with every day, but I surveyed and discussed kind of the experiences a few customers were having with large Windows fleets, automating and managing Windows fleets. So we're going to baseline. We're going to talk about DevOps. We're absolutely going to hit on Windows-specific elements and aspects. So that doesn't mean that the principles and concepts that I talk about aren't germane to Linux environments, but I'm going to literally talk about features and capabilities and services and, and times when things became Windows-enabled, right? And there's been a long history of sort of Linux first, Windows second. I'm super encouraged because I've done Chicago and New York, and I've been focusing on SQL Server on RDS and sort of how that's evolved. And I've focused on um, all the different things on the Windows space. And we keep seeing sort of a lot of interest. So it's cool that, that, that folks are, are recognizing that AWS has a Windows story. I break it into two key categories, pushing code, operating code. Um, and you'll hear me talk about this in, in a sort of general sense. Um, but those are kind of the two sides of the automation spectrum. Last but not least, and I drop these into a lot of different slides, I'll show you patterns of success, right? I'm not gonna say, and you will not hear me say, there is one singular way to do all these things, but there are patterns that are seen as successful, patterns that are being repeated in these conversations and discussions I have with customers. Disclaimer time, okay. This isn't me trying to get out of, of, of diving into everything, but we've got an hour, right? I wanna show you a demo. I wanna talk about some case studies. So, there's things that I can't really get into. I won't say there's a singular approach. I already mentioned that. I, I, innovations are not frozen in time. I'm not here to announce anything. You've heard about a lot of new services, and those are certainly interesting and great to go explore, and we can talk about them. I, I, I will tell you what's available today. And last but not least, containers. And if you're kind of following the Windows space, you know Windows Server 2016 is working on a, a, a way to enable containers, so Docker could become sort of a very relevant part of this story. I think Docker probably has a very serious role to play in DevOps and automation and management and, and, and having portability, and I think it's cool. I'm not going to talk much more about it. Okay, This is a Windows talk, and if you go and try to do Docker on Windows today, you're running Linux and VMs on Windows, and it's not, you know what I mean? There's not the same sort of story there. So we really won't dive into it, but I, I just want to say as a disclaimer, that doesn't mean I don't think kind of it's going to likely be part of the discussion. And, and see previous bullet, innovations are not frozen in time. right? So you do have to become agile and nimble and learn new things. Boy, if there's no, nothing that you take away from, from some of our sessions, when you see these new services and you see the cadence, I mean, you're going to be constantly learning in this cloud space for the foreseeable future. OK, now let's get specific. Let's get into Windows platform issues. Um, and listen, I worked there for six years. I, I know these things. There, there's tight dependencies on domain infrastructure. There's legacy security models that get brought along. And this probably does speak very much to the idea of moving solutions and applications that are running on Windows into AWS. Um, reboots are just 
brutal to automate, right? There's a, there's a certain non-deterministic nature of something that's rebooting and starting back up, and then, you know, the developer in me realizes I'm, I'm writing a lot of if conditionals to know if something got installed or didn't get installed, and if I screw that up, I reinstall, ah, right? I mean, there, it can be done, but it's painful. Uh, lots of heavy software packages, some of which are available to the install media, some of which aren't. We'll talk about that. Um, but I've seen customers try to automate through the user data startup scripts a full SQL server install. That's heavy. That's long. Um, it's difficult to be agile and add nodes, remove nodes in a dynamic way when you take those kinds of platform challenges on. Uh, and bootstrapping options are, are limited. And when I say limited, I don't say that necessarily in a, in a super negative manner. Um, it's PowerShell, and you, as long as you grok PowerShell, you're cool, right? I mean, that's really where a lot of the automation comes to bear. All right, so patterns of success, reduced dependencies. This is maybe a no duh, maybe not. Maybe you don't recognize in some cases where the dependencies have crept into your, your, your actual solution architecture. Uh, domain infrastructure, Windows integrated security, remote access, right? Those are all dependencies you've taken on with your deployment. So now you've got to figure out how to automate those things and sort of as you're doing iterations and versions, all these dependencies can become a challenge, right? So reduce the dependencies whenever possible. And that, you'll see this too. It doesn't mean you have to reduce them completely. Maybe reduce them from certain tiers. Maybe there's just places that you can't. So if you have to do it, think about scenarios like you know, running a domain controller within AWS. We've got patterns and white papers. In fact, our most, our most downloaded white paper is running and installing Active Directory in AWS. Why? My opinion, because I don't, you know, we don't get reasons for every single uh, white paper download, but um, my, my theory is you, know, you want to run in a manner in which you can be isolated from those things that you would be dependent upon, like a VPN or a direct connect line. Those things could go down, which would create connectivity problems, which would create solution failures, which would create unhappy users, and all that is just badness. So recognize that this is a problem. So Windows integrated security requires domain joins, right? Renaming your server is going to require a reboot. Um, these things, reboots are going to slow you down. So try to, try to avoid them if you can. Okay, before I jump into my two kind of key topic areas or the, the way I distribute the, the talk here, I'm just going to play a little bit of a game of what is the average developer on the pushing code side thinking in a given day? And maybe this resonates with some of you in the audience. Maybe not. I think it probably does. So the developer's kind of sitting there, coming in in the morning, grabbing his coffee, and he's got five new features that need to be done by Friday, or he's just not going to be able to get to happy hour. Um, on the operations side, you know, you've got, you've got a patch of servers. Maybe you heard about a new security vulnerability. So these are, these are just things, right? There's friction to sort of being continuously delivering and updating things. And it's, this isn't necessarily Windows specific. This is that kind of cut category of just how do we get agile? How do we do DevOps? I've got more bugs to squash. Oh, geez, I didn't write perfect code. I mean, I didn't have a lot of bugs in my code when I was developing. I'm sure. <laughs> that guy knows me. Um, and, you know, that's, that's, a, that's another challenge. There's more work to be done. Um, meeting invites to a security audit review, that kind of falls under the operational side. So you can kind of see the camps get divided a little bit. There's different focuses that people have day in and day out. Um, and then, you know, should I perf test that code? And, you know, we're driving a whole crap ton of traffic to our site this weekend. Are we ready? Is it going to scale? Is it going to work? And I do think developers and I do think IT ops need to be in the same team on this stuff. And I think that's where DevOps has become so cool is that everybody's at the table in a lot of these discussions finding creative ways. And that's why I think the clouds become really interesting because you can get really agile and dynamic and add instances, right? So at the end of, the, at the end of it all, you just need more hours in the day to do this you know, massive amounts of work. Okay. Let's jump into pushing code. So on the front end side, and this section will end with me doing a demo that leverages code deploy. So you'll see from Visual Studio how we can target EC2 instances with you know, GitHub in the middle. So we're gonna, we're gonna take this all the way through. First and foremost, continuous delivery. I'm gonna get real preachy on this, but I, I do know that you know, if we're talking DevOps, we're talking continuous delivery, we're talking continuous integration, CI, CD, um, Hopefully, the, hopefully what you're looking to do or what you're looking to accomplish when you're, when you're in a DevOps role is increasing the frequency or the velocity of this iterative, iterative approach that you've got from build, test, and release. And that kind of comes in a lot of different factors. So let's talk about how it comes into play when we're building the team, right? First thing. So you're going to have to have these kinds of skills. And this isn't saying there's one specific person must have all these skills, and that's the only way you're successful. This is the team. 
This is the team that's capable of, of sort of driving this process. So you, there's going to be software development skills on this team, right? So there's going to be, there's going to be tooling experience. And, and this is not me saying there's one tool that is the thing you must know, but you've got to gain muscle. How do we get better at something? How do you get better at golf? I've never figured this out, but you practice, right? It's expensive to do that. Golf maybe is a bad metaphor, but there's, there's things that you do to get better and build muscle, and it's repetition. So you've got to pick a tool and get good at it, right? And we'll talk about some. We'll talk about some that, that AWS has embraced and is making available to you in a managed service. Uh, Windows administration. It doesn't take you very long, and you'll see in my demo that I can go write a bunch of ASP.NET code, and I can push it into a server, but then, wait a minute, I've got to set up the IS site. Oh, wait a minute, I've got to know how to stop that IS site. Oh, wait, I've got to know which port is running that website so that it doesn't conflict with that, right? That's when, like, understanding IS. That's an element of somebody who's operated that Windows platform in a lot of cases. It was abstracted when I was just a pure dev. That was just magic. I just shipped it over the fence, and somebody figured it out. But in aggregate, somebody's got to understand all this stuff so that it can get lean and mean and fast and repetitive. And you've got to know AWS services if you're going to do this stuff in our platform, right? You've got to know what CloudFormation does. You've got to know if Beanstalk is something that you want to target, why? And how does that work? And, and what are the options on the operational side? I'm going to give you kind of a, a broad stroke here of those things with Windows-specific elements, but it's on you guys and gals to go off and sort of get really good at what ever sort of services you want to leverage to do your continuous delivery. So another pattern of success, start with the developers. It's not a slight on the operational team, but the reality is you're not going to get very far if the developers aren't doing automated tests, period. Right? If there aren't ways for you to take the code, commit the code, run automated tests, and then start to push things in an automated fashion, gates or no gates, you're not going to push things very quickly all the way through to production. There's going to be too much risk if it's not done in a good automated way. When you have a regression, if there aren't tests added, that's a problem. These are, these are coding and development practices. So if you're in a role that's in a DevOps category or dev infrastructure team or operational expert, um, one of the things that you have to focus on first is getting the developers sort of into a mindset of doing things in a, in a consistent manner that can help facilitate this automation. Moving fast and try to abstract the things that don't necessarily become critical to them continuing to move new releases out, right? Where you fetch a key or where you fetch certificates from to set up SSL, like, like that can be abstracted, right? Those kinds of things can be sort of behind the scenes, behind the curtains. All right, ooh, a little fast. All right, let's talk services. Let's talk services in AWS. Um, and there's kind of from left to right here, there's, different, there's a different kind of concept here, the different concepts of abstraction. Things that you can sort of just use as a higher level service that take your code packages and roll them out within a, a set of constraints that make sense to run what you're going to run. So like a Beanstalk, we'll talk about how that's a web-based application with IS of a specific flavor and .NET of a specific flavor, and you kind of roll with that. And then all the way to the right-hand side is sort of the opposite extreme of I'm going to build it with these building blocks that can help me do the automation and then use code deploy as a way to push the application. Because if you're familiar with CloudFormation, and, and let me say that none, I'm not going into the, a deep three, 400 level on any one of these independent services, but I am going to tell you that CloudFormation as a do-it-yourself technology stops at some level. And if you're familiar with CloudFormation, you know this. It gets the network set up. It gets the security groups and the firewalls set up. It gets whatever automation you can run at the beginning of your, of your startup sequence but then it kind of stops, right? It's not yet you know, pushing the application code from a central location and allowing you to do revisions and back it up. That's code deploy. So those two together, we'll talk a lot about. All right, so Beanstalk. Um, it's described as an easy to use service for deploying and scaling web applications. Okay, now what, is it, what does it have for Windows specifically? First of all, it's using S3 as a convoy for your code, right? So you've got tools in Visual Studio that can target Beanstalk as a deployment and, and push it out. And it comes you know, with a, a CloudFormation template that sort of understands a, a set of AMIs, AMIs, which is our templating engine in, in AWS. And that, that template, right, those, those already have pre-configured uh, setups for IIS and for .NET. And you pick the versions and you go. And then you get some interesting operational features on the back end. You get the ability to do URL swapping. We'll do rolling upgrades. We'll let you pull logs, right? So if you distribute across multiple instances, you can pull logs back together. 
Um, so this is the first one I'm telling you about here on the AWS side, and maybe many of you knew this, maybe some of you didn't, but Beanstalk is a very relevant deployment model for doing .NET and web-based applications for Windows. Here's, an, here's a tip. Um, you've got a couple of different mechanisms available for making version changes on Beanstalk. You can go with fixed size or percentage-based rolling updates. Right, so if, you, if you're looking for different strategies, and this becomes quite interesting when you think about things like multiple availability zones in different regions, and you know, to what degree can you tolerate 30% of your, of your capacity down or 50% of your capacity down? So if you can roll things out across multiple availability zones, you can do some pretty interesting things if you pick and choose which one makes the most sense for you. So there's a lot of flexibility in this model because the way you can roll the upgrades out can use these different configuration switches. Not a Windows-specific tip, but a good one to recognize and understand when you start getting into iterations. Cool. Chef for Windows. And you know this is an interesting one, and the, the customer stories I have at the end will talk a little bit about this. Now, um, Chef has become a, a very popular model for Windows. In fact, I, I had a conversation with, with our friends at Chef um, before this session, and you know, they told me there's been, there's been a, 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 real, a real burst in the last 18 months of folks coming out in their, in their supermarket. If you've, if you've not explored Chef, there's, there's a supermarket with cookbooks already made and available. And one of the things I hear from a lot of customers is, listen, man, I don't want to reinvent the wheel. Somebody should have figured this out, right? Domain joining an instance and then rebooting it and coming back through. Like, how's that being done? And why am I trying to figure all that crap out, right? That, that's, this is something we should be able to just leverage. Um, and Chef's a good example of that. There's an ecosystem out there that you can use. It's a, it's a Ruby-based config management framework. Um, it's got a pull model, so everything is its own autonomous distributed actor. Right? So it's able to sort of do an awful lot of configuration management on your behalf. And I'm leading with Chef because I'm going to tell you about an AWS service after this that will help you do Chef. Now, WinRM, if you're familiar with that, that's how a lot of the remote management's done. And one of the cool things is PowerShell. I mentioned it earlier, right, for bootstrapping and configuring Windows instances. It's extremely tight integration that occurs here. Uh, in fact, the des desired state configuration model that exists with PowerShell sort of at, at its core, uh, Chef treats that like a first-class citizen, like a real object. So you can see there's lots of different Chef objects, placeholders, templates, ways to build reusable components, and, and there's this ecosystem. And then there's this PowerShell integration. So there's a really cool Windows story here. So what have we done at AWS? Well, as of May of 2015, we made that an option with, specifically with Windows Server 2012 R2 and Chef 12.2, but we made that an option for you to actually automate and manage. And this kind of can cover both sides of the spectrum a little bit. We're focused a bit on the pushing of the code side, but it's absolutely relevant on the operating side as well, right? Because now you've got your configuration management all in a centralized area. So if there's ever a worry of configuration drift, you know in a central location what should be running, what cookbooks, what recipes have kicked off and should have configured this instance in a specific way. Right, so this does kind of play a role on both sides. Um, Stacks can reference a supermarket or custom cookbooks, and this is one of those ones with the asterisks. This is a Windows-specific thing. Right, there's different kinds of um, uh, stacks within uh, Opsworks, uh, if it's not Windows, but we do custom or the ones that are based off of the supermarket. So there's, there's a little bit different there, and there's different scaling types. So um, Opsworks is our managed service. Windows is an option. Uh, an example of a cookbook you can go grab, a popular one, is the Windows AD. We keep talking about this, right? It keeps coming back up. Uh, Windows AD is, is this is going to help with the configuring of nodes, domain joining, and you know, all the complexity and challenges that, that come with it have, you know, I mean, it's, the nut's been cracked. All right, code deploy. I love this one. I love this one because it lets me get a little further down and do iterations of development. It's definitely a big one on the pushing of code side. Um, it's a service for automating code deployments. It's an agent. Right. It's an agent you install. We make it available for you sitting in S3. It's a simple two-line script to pull it and install it in a silent fashion with an MSI. Uh, there's lifecycle hooks in this service. So you can run different scripts, PowerShell scripts. I'll show you some before you install, after you install. There's, there's a couple of others as well, and I'll show it in my demo. Uh, but the key concepts are here is you've got applications, different revisions, different deployment groups, and you kind of figure out how you want to roll out, the different speed in which you want to roll out. You want to do one at a time, you want to do all at once. I mean, all at once is great for development. Might not make sense at all in a production setting, but code deploy is a, is a pretty easy way to sort of get up and running with a, with a push, with a full uh, development pipeline. So code can be sourced using Git or S3, and one of the customers I talked to is using Git on top of TFS. 
right? Those are, those are part gets Git, right? I use GitHub in my demo because it's an easy one to go set up and, and use, but, but gets Git. Um, and S3 is the other option, right? So if you don't want to do Git or you don't like that tooling, you just want to keep it simple and push a, push a set of code out into S3, that's perfectly fine as well. We'll talk about the YAML thing when I do the demo. That's kind of the style in which you set up what's going to be installed. So Visual Studio can integrate directly with GitHub, or you can build an automation pipeline that puts things in, in S3. Last service, Windows specific, forward your eyes down to the bottom. I love this, I love, and that's not even all of them, folks. There's actually quite a bit more um, as far as the templates that have been made available. And, and I think, you know, I mentioned the, the white paper for Active Directory, but as we, like SharePoint deployments, like as we come up with, you know, what are our best practices? What does Amazon AWS talk to its customers about for deploying these things in a successful way? We come with corresponding CFTs. CloudFormation templates. So you see them all right there, SharePoint, Active Directory, Link, the big one code deployment agents at the, at the bottom as, as it relates to what we're talking about with the build yourself uh, model here. And, and you know, the one thing to, to keep in mind here, this is, this is one of those things that does require some repetition and understanding and building muscle. There is a JSON template, but it's a, it's a, there's a lot of intrinsic language stuff that you get used to. So you get, you get these templates, you start working with them. Uh, customers that I work with are only starting from something like this and then tweaking it for their own needs. So we talked about this, a do-it-yourself way to implement an end-to-end -end automation is to use CFTs with code deploy agents that are deployed. Bootstrapping. The, the hard part about bootstrapping is there's, there's, different, there's different nuances to the different services when you start getting into bootstrapping. Um, I mean, when we're talking about code deploy agents, there's the lifecycle hooks, and they've got your, there's ways in which you can, you know, you gotta understand some of the elements of that, like the, the fact that there's defaults of 30 minute timeouts in the different lifecycle hooks. Uh, with CloudFormation, you gotta kinda understand these wait conditions, so if things are being rebooted, and, and how do you signal that it's okay to move forward. Um, if you ever look at one of our templates, you'll always notice the commands are, are one dash, two dash, three dash. That's because by default we do alphabetical execution of those things. So all I'm saying with bootstrapping is know the service that you're going to use, build some muscle around it, get comfortable with its nuances, and then you'll, you'll be more successful, right? Uh, so that, that's a big one. Be aware of assumptions and prerequisites. I talk about ops works and recipe dependencies, code deploy and timeouts. Um, a lot of these things typically require local admin permissions to execute, but they're on the box. They're executing on the box, so it's not always a, a, a huge um, hindrance, right? It's a lot harder sometimes to do that in a remote execution model, uh, but just know that those things come up. Um, so this is code. Remember to build reusable components, and that's where here's my, I, I like PowerShell for this. I know I said it's, it's the somewhat limitation, but it also has a, a good way to sort of repackage, build commandlets that are reused over and over again, right? These are, PowerShell is a, is a really nice scripting plus plus kind of language, right, that you can do quite a bit with. Okay, PowerShell. Here's the other thing with PowerShell. Uh, we produce um, AWS tools for Windows PowerShell with 900 plus commandlets in it. If you haven't downloaded it and you haven't used it, boy, this is gonna help you out a lot. And I mean, the 900 plus commandlets is us providing the, the ease of use on top of our APIs, right? All of our APIs in, inside of the services that you may want to call as you're, as you're executing a PowerShell commandlet remotely uh, or on your instances, right? This is, this is all available here within this package. Uh, it's bundled with the AWS SDK for .NET if you're looking for it. That's, that's where you'd go find it. Uh, and you can use PowerShell version 2, 3, or 4. Uh, 5 still preview. It's not, I'm not saying it won't work, but... Um, there's a great webinar if you're interested in, in digging just specifically into PowerShell uh, that Mike Pfeiffer did, who's another big uh, Windows specialist on the AWS side. Um, if you're using three or four, then you'll get this auto load thing going on with PowerShell. If it's older, then just know you've got to do the import module. It's a, it's a bit back in the day, but I don't, it depends on which version of PowerShell you're using. That's just a tip, I'm trying to prevent some frustration if you go out and start using this stuff. So profile options and defaulting features exist, which just means whatever you're setting up on this machine to do remote execution or your laptop, um, the profiles of your secret key and access, that can all be set up and reused across things like Visual Studio and these PowerShell tools. So you're not constantly worried about typing in this, this long, long encryption, or uh, the long security keys. All right, I'm gonna break out of, of slides and I'm gonna show you a demo here quick. So my demo, has a couple of moving parts, but, but the, the main thing I really want to have you take away from this 
is how simple it is to sort of get moving with uh, code deploy and pushing different code releases uh, via Visual Studio. So I'm running, first of all, I'm running Visual Studio inside of an EC2 instance. Now, it's an MSDN licensed version, and you can do that if you're running on a dedicated instance. Just a, just a note, right? That's an option for you. Sometimes folks don't understand or know that. They just haven't sort of looked at what are some of the, you know, specifics of doing that if you're going to run this inside of, of, of Visual Studio or Visual Studio inside of EC2. Uh, why would I do that? I mean, it's, well, first of all, I'm on a Mac. That's maybe the first time thing. Uh, this, the second thing is uh, it's super fast, right? I'm running and, and executing against different uh, AWS services, and it's just smoking fast. Uh, so that, that's really helpful. Of course, I can turn it on and off and all the other things that are beautiful with an elastic platform. Uh, so that's one thing. There are other options, though, one of which is you got a Windows PC, install Visual Studio, done, pretty obvious. Um, workspaces. Workspaces not long ago came up with this concept of an application manager that you can actually deploy on top of a Workspaces uh, virtual desktop, uh, Visual Studio. And you can do different, different levels of it, and you're basically going to pay a monthly license fee via AWS to run Visual Studio inside of a Workspace. Um, I didn't go with that model. I went with this because I've got MSCN. So, um, if you don't have that, though, you could do it to, for individual licenses, and you could use it and then not use it another month. So again, it's nice that the, the idea of sort of uh, elastic economics is kind of creeping into some of the licensing models here. So it's, it could be very interesting for you. So what did I have to do here? Now, I've got, I've got some things deployed. I'll start by just showing you them. I've got a couple of servers. Uh, note the two that are running. One is the Visual Studio one I just described to you. The other one is this code deploy uh, .NET tester. So I created a code deploy server target. It's a Windows server, right? Obviously, I'm going to run IS and .NET. I'm going to show you an actual website that's been deployed and running. Um, how did I do that? Well, I'll show you in... I jump all over the place with the tools. There's certain tools I like to use. and uh, Effectively, I ran these, these commands. Not that command. Hold on a second. That command. Right, so here's an AWS EC2 run instances. Um, might be a little tough in the back of the room, sorry. Uh, this, is, this is just a, a simple way in which you can just, in a command line, kick up an EC2 instance. And a couple of things to note here. One, I have an AMI that's based off of Windows Server. Another thing, here's my user data script. Instance setup.txt. Okay, well, let's look at that. Instance setup.txt does three things. Installs .NET, the latest version of .NET. If you didn't know this, here's another good thing to know. We give you the install media on the C Windows Win SXX drive, right? That makes it easier to just kind of install some of those service features that require the install media. Um, so I do that first, silently. Next thing I do is, here I am deploying my code deploy agent.msi file. This is available inside of S3. You can see I'm running some PowerShell here to read the S3 object down, kicking it off in a window style of hidden so that it's in the background and installs this agent and boom. So it's a service. It's there, it's up and running, and now it's able to sort of accept incoming deployment revisions. Last but not least, the one that gets a little heavier is IIS. So I add the Windows service feature of the web components and then all those other add-ons I've added so that I can do ASP.NET and all the other things that, that I would want to do to target this as a web server for development. So those are the two key things. Now what I'll do is I'll step back to uh, my, my Visual Studio box. All right, this application, let me, just, let me just get this out of the way. When I write little demos like this, um, I, I get the opportunity to actually build something that my eight-year-old daughter finds cool. So you are going to see princesses on the screen. If you watch another talk from me, you'll likely see more princesses on the screen. Um, I'll make her a software engineer at some point. We'll see. Uh, so this is the soccer team. I'm the, the soccer team coach, so I came up with a way just to kind of do a simple, I mean, forgive the old school um, simple web programming, but I've got an RDS database behind this that has the whole soccer team in it, and I've written a web application that basically spits HTML out on the screen. I'll show it to you here. It is up and running on that code deploy server. So the, the concept is I have some business logic in here, simple business logic. If you've scored more than I think I have it currently set to eight goals, you're on the all-star team. So we're going to lower the bar a little bit. I know that's not good, but we're having a hard time fill the all-star team out. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and change the logic inside of Visual Studio. That logic lives right here. And you can see sort of old, I actually wrote out some HTML. I actually still remember how to write HTML. All right. So I'm going to go back, and I'm going to change my logic to, oh, I don't know. 
I'm, I'm nice, let's go. Two goals, if you've scored more than two goals, you've, you've officially made the all-star team. All right, so now you can see I'm checked out. Now what I've done is I've set up Visual Studio to talk to GitHub. So I, I did a couple of things here. Now one, one I kind of went with poor man's model here for um, actually setting up a deployment. So what I do is I, I do a post build copy of the binary so that I can just copy those, those as an output directory. What you'd likely do in a real pipeline is you'd have an integration server, a team city or something along those lines that would do your build independent of my dev box. That's just, this is sort of to keep things at least a little simple initially. Um, something I wanna show you here, a couple of key things before I deploy the revision. One, notice these PowerShell scripts over here. So I've got a, this is the most sophisticated of them. There's a delete website and an install website. So what I'm doing is I'm scorching the earth. I'm getting rid of everything and I'm installing everything every time. That is a pattern, that is a principle that hopefully you start to embrace because you do want to sort of be able to recreate everything from scratch at any point in time. So in here, you'll see I'm creating a new application pool. I'm creating a new website. I am stopping the default website. I am turning the auto starting off so that it doesn't keep coming up when I do a reboot, which I learned uh, as I went through this. Um, and then I, I go ahead and deploy this, I create this, and I map it to the directory that I'm gonna copy to. Now, how do I know where my code's going? You may be noticing too in this solution, I have a couple of other .NET testers, one that uses DynamoDB, one that uses SQS. These all actually come with the SDK. If you go in and you look at the SDK, these samples are already there. So if you wanna start doing some simple coding against uh, AWS with .NET, there's a lot of great stuff in the SDK. So let's look at the YAML file quick. Pretty simple, I've only done two things. I've hooked up two event hooks. I've done the before install and the after install. So I'm deleting the website and recreating the website in those two steps. The pieces up at the top, the key ones are, I'm targeting the OS of Windows, that's a, that's a requirement of that YAML file, and YAML's just a configuration file, a specific set of configuration elements that our code deploy agent knows how to manage and look for. So now, as the code gets copied in, and it's gonna suck it in, and I'll show you how I do this, I suck it in from GitHub, and then it goes through and it takes all those source files and puts them in the destination location. So there's your C, INET, pub, dub, dub, root, I didn't get creative with putting them into a different directory or anything, I just drop them into a folder there, and that is exactly what it's looking for. The only other thing I do is I, I move the uh, PowerShell files so that my batch scripts can go target those. Um, not, not a lot of complexity here. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead now and check this in. And let's go look for my commits. And say uh, all star logic changed. And I will commit and sync. Oh, hold on a second. I almost choked. Let's go back here. This is not, this was, this was uh, some poor, poor uh, pair programming here. Uh, what I need to do first is I need to rebuild the solution. So I'm gonna rebuild the web project. The web project spits out those files. Uh, I noticed it because in here I should have had more files committed to the change. Now you can see I've got the DLL and, this, and, the, and the code behind page. And now I can go ahead and commit and sync those. Commit and sync and it's pushed through. Now what happens is on the other side, I go back to GitHub, you can see in here, I've got 39 commits, and this is where, this is where the code deploy hook comes in. So I'm gonna copy this commit ID, and that commit ID is what I end up putting into the code deploy agent. Now, one of the things I sort of zoomed past on you is a key element of, of tagging these is creating a tag that we recognize. Uh, so when I've created the deployment group, and I'll show this to you in a minute, I created tags that specifically I look for when uh, the, the code deploy agent is deploying a new revision. So I come back here, I go into code deploy. Da, da, da. Code deploy our, in our developer tools. And I have a few different test harnesses, and they're really just those different YAML files with some different distribution groups. Um, I've done quite a few different deployments, and what I'm able to do now is deploy a new revision. I need to pick that application, I need to pick this deployment group, and I am in GitHub. Now, this looks pretty already configured, right? So I don't, I don't, wanna, I don't wanna do the whole kind of behind the mirror thing. Um, you do go through and do an SSO login from AWS's code deploy so that you have the permissions to actually go and pull that code down. So I've already, I've already done that. I'm not gonna take you through watching me type a password, probably screw it up twice and get it right the third time. So .NET code deploy. And this is just my repository. If you remember from back here, this is just my repository and my actual um, account. And then I'm gonna paste in that commit ID. And here's my options, all at once, one at a time, half at a time. 
All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and deploy that, kick that off. So behind the scenes, that's been created. It really won't take very long, but while we wait, I just wanna show you how simple it is to go in and create a new application. So if I was gonna create a new application, Tom's, Tom's test, um, Tom's test uh, deployment group, you'll see where the options start to show up. So down here, this is where I start to pick the keys, right? So the, what key am I looking for and how am I tagging, how am I tagging that for it to be a deployment target? So I would, I would definitely have had to, and you can see the instances are being, um, are being shown on the side here. So let's see here, code deploy demo server, .NET testers, and I have one instance available. So I know that because that's what I've deployed, but there's nothing stopping me from creating 50 instances and deploying to all 50 of them all at the same time from code deploy. Uh, down here, I do set a default setting, but you saw I can override this with each revision. So one at a time, all at once, half at a time. Here's the different choices. Uh, and then this is the key here. We're gonna go in and pick a specific um, I am or a specific role for the EC2 instance, because the code I'm deploying may need specific permissions to call DynamoDB, SQS. I am not gonna attempt to go into a deep, you know, a deep dive on I am at the moment, uh, but, but this is the way in which you would attach it to that code deploy server so that I could actually make sure that I could call the AWS services that I need. Um, okay, let's see here. Let's just give it EC2 full, it's fine. We're not gonna, I'm just gonna do this as a sample. Um, so, okay, no, I'm not. All right. Well, I'm, I'm, it's, that's how you'd create it. You'd create it with a, with a given role and you'd be good to go. I'm just not gonna create that right now. So I'm gonna go check the actual deployment that we did. So let's go check the deployments and see if that's been successful. It has, right? So when we come in here, you can see all the instances. Now I've only got the one instance, but then you can see all the different events that had triggered. And this would be your troubleshooting experience, by the way. But I can get on the instance as well. It's just an instance like any other instance that I could remote into and, and do troubleshooting with, for. So you can see here's how quick it ran through. You know, it took a couple seconds, it ran all that PowerShell, it pushed all that code, it started everything up, and it's up and running again. And here, if everything went well, we should have quite a bit more people in the All-Star team, right? So, I didn't have to get on the instance, I didn't have to touch it, I wrote code, I deployed it, I put it into GitHub. Now that could have been TFS and anything else, um, but I, I was able to sort of get this full pipeline working all the way through. That's code deploy. All right. I hopefully you found that kind of cool and pretty easy. It's an easy agent approach. It takes you a little bit past the CloudFormation template stuff. Uh, as I talk to customers, a lot of people embracing this as a way to take CloudFormation to that next level and get the code on the box. All right, let's talk about operating the code now. It's been pushed, it's up there, it's deployed, and folks are trying to manage it. So folks are trying to scale it. So first and foremost, and I think you hear this from, a, from us a lot, try to get away from having remote access onto those servers. Why? Because you gotta deal with configuration drift. There's some interesting things here, like OpsWorks actually gives you a way to do temporary credentials. So, so first, well, a couple things. If it's dev test, right, this isn't the end of the world. People having access to these dev test boxes is a pretty normal scenario, but as you start to get into where you go to that, remember I mentioned you go to that build server, that moves to a release, that release pushes it somewhere. This is a pattern for success now. At that point, we, we should be getting away from remote access onto those servers as much as humanly possible. Uh, centralized remote configuration tools drive consistency. That's where things like Chef come to the rescue if things are getting tweaked and tuned and getting screwed up. Uh, so keep those in mind. Baking AMIs, I think this becomes a pretty serious thing to consider or, or something that you really want to look at. And I've had this question a couple times downstairs at the Ask the Experts booth for Windows. You know, what are, you, what are folks doing for sort of patch management, remote management? Um, as I talk to customers, it's baking AMIs. It's managing AMIs. Uh, and and that, that may seem like an old school technique, but here's the deal. Like you can get consistent with this, you can get repetitive with this, you can bake the AMI, install all your software, and this is where you're operating code. Code is this custom application I wrote, or it's a patch from a third party vendor, or it's the latest Patch Tuesday with all the stuff coming down on the operating system. That's code, right? Somebody's writing a code, maybe it's not in your company, but now you need to operate that code. So let's go through and deploy it in a consistent manner. Let's bake it, let's manage it, and let's decrease that boot time as much as you possibly can. Um, so you know, try to strike a balance, I say, between things that you know change often and things that just change you know, every now and then so that you can automate sort of the install of things uh, versus having to bake them all in. 
So there's some easy interfaces for creating the AMI and importing the AMI if you want to bring it from there. And, and Packer.io has some, some cool tools to make those, those things that you're building uh, reusable in, in other virtualization platforms. So uh, keep that in mind. This is definitely an effort uh, that you should consider. And you know, starting from existing Amazon-provided images is always the best practice. Um, you can create your own. I know I mentioned there's some easy interfaces. But starting from you know, our images gives you a much better success rate uh, it's already in AWS, so it's already six, you know, going to boot, going to run. There's not a lot of extra work to be done. Uh, this is just one of the things that we often recommend. It just gets challenging to sort of do it in, in your on-premises environment and push you know, many gigabytes up in the internet and then do imports and exports and all that. OK, so deploying apps with blue-green. And, and we, this actually comes from uh, a, a 400 deep dive talk about blue-green deployments. I, I know some of my. Uh, colleague, or some of my customers were trying to get into it, and I heard it was a very busy and popular session, and I'm not surprised at all. Um, this is operating your code and doing it in a manner in which you can roll out new versions in a very, very low-risk manner. Now, I'm not going to cover all these blue-green deployments. No way. I'm going to focus on one. I'm going to focus on the auto-scaling group model. Um, there's another reference to Docker here. Obviously, not a Windows-specific reference, but just in general, knowing different ways to do blue-green deployments. Uh, the classic one is DNS cutover, uh, where you're able to sort of run things side by side and be able to migrate uh, back and forth to them. So auto-scaling groups. If you're not familiar with these, these are, the, these are the ways in which you can wrap around EC2 instances. And the model here would take you from you know, a, an existing application running, targeting backend services. Um, the, the, the load balancer is just pointing to this auto-scaling group. And what you start to do is you start to set up a secondary auto-scaling group. It doesn't have to be regis registered with the load balancer yet. It could be set up and, and running uh, on another auto-scaling group, and you can start to build on top of that. Then what you can do is you can start to route over to that, and you can start to run them in parallel. Now, this can be challenging, right? The, the, the big one, the big stick in the mud with this often is um, schema changes on your database, right? So you may, in some cases, need to run two versions of the database and figure out a synchronization strategy. But ideally, you can just point them both to the same databases, to the, the same backends, and start adding and removing instances. So as you add instances, you start sunsetting the others, right? You can take these out offline. So this whole blue-green model really can be done in a couple of different ways. This is just an example of doing it with auto-scaling groups and ELB. And it would be, it would be ideal. I mean, the, the web service that I just showed you a little while ago would fit in this model perfectly, right? Uh, it just gets interesting if you're doing too much with the data schema. And if you want to talk more about that, we can do it uh, after the session. Cool, so that's done. Health checking. Uh, there's a couple things here. Uh, lots of health checks available, both for the load balancers, Route 53, uh, CloudWatch, alarms. You know, we have a lot in the platform. The thing I want you to really take a, a, a careful uh, look at is something that, if you haven't heard about it, this is definitely worth the price of admission here. I mean, you have an actual CloudWatch logs plugin for Windows that can collect all the logs on the Windows instances. You go to the you go to the service config tool that's on the Windows instances, install that, make sure you've got the appropriate IAM permissions, and you can collect Windows instrumentation data and look at it without having to get on the instance. So see previous slide about staying off the instances? You can do that if you configure and get these things set up so that you're pulling all that data back down. It's the first thing you always hear. Oh, well, the, the thing's behaving inappropriately. I got to get on the instance. Well, you can be looking at the logs off of the instances. So the CloudWatch Logs plugin is configured. Um, it's disabled by default, right? So some people don't know that that's there. Log aggregation and analysis. So I just mentioned a lot of logs. There's more, right? There's the, we've got new ones now, VPC flow logs. We've got CloudTrail data. There's S3 access logs. So what are you doing with these piles of data? Again, on the operating side, how am I, how am I sort of picking through this and looking for the needle in the haystack of haystacks? Um, the, the, the cool stuff that we've done recently is we've made some, um, we've made some CloudFormation templates available for you to pull these, these logs through. Uh, with Kinesis subscriptions and build uh, dashboards in front of it. So go take a look at that. That's a nice way that you can do this. You can go in and take a look at uh, Kibana dashboards on top of this, these CloudWatch logs data. So go search for that. Uh, I think there's a, there's a link available in the slides if you go pick them up on SlideShare. All right. Pattern for success here. I do always try to have at least one Anchorman reference in all of my sessions. Um, all I'm trying to say here is 60% of the time, it works every time is not good enough, right? This is tongue in cheek. Uh, you, you do have to adhere to some of these principles to get good. You've got to get consistent and repetitive. Um, you've, got to, you've got to have no remote access whenever possible. Maybe use it intermittently um, in, in scenarios where you're still getting better, but let's not, let's not rely on it all the time. Uh, test automation, absolutely, day one. 
Uh, patching is no different than rolling a new release of your custom code. Consistently only happens when you treat it all as disposable, right? This whole thing that I showed you in code deploy, I took, I took, I took a very intentional decision there to completely wipe off everything on that instance before I deployed a new one. Um, that's the same thing I hope you'd be doing with new instances, starting from a new, brand new AMI that's been baked and made available and ready to go and can be deployed dynamically. Blue-green deployments are the norm in, in the customers that I talk to that are being successful with, with large fleets. Okay, we've got about 15 minutes left. I gotta, I'll, I'll probably spend about five minutes talking about these, these case studies, and then we'll save the last 10 minutes for Q&A. Um, I've got some key customers I've talked to. Now, we're going to have to get into a little minor trust relationship here. Um, these customers have decided that they don't want names and logos sort of uh, uh, put out here publicly. So um, I've got customer X and customer Y. But the trust relationship we're in right now is that uh, I am talking about real customers. Um, I did not fabricate all this stuff. You are going to see lessons learned from these customers. Um, and and they're, they're very real. They're very real customers doing this kind of work. So first and foremost, this, this, if, I don't know where you're starting from. I don't know if you're starting from a place where there's no test automation. Um, I've got no ability to sort of roll regular releases. Um, every time I have a new, new code version, it takes me six weeks to deploy. I don't know. I don't know where you're starting from. But let's just say um, one of the customers I talked to, you know, they, they actually had you know, not a lot of automation at the time. Um, they were exploring with some, some of these types of chef models, but targeting exclusively Linux. Um, and it, it doesn't take as long as you think. So, so basically, they, they were brought in six months ago, and, and the progress they've made is, um, is just amazing. Uh, the first order of business, though, for them, and you saw this in one of my patterns, was focus on the development practices. Get those best practices figured out. Get those consistent. Uh, early evaluations they did were with Chef and Ansible. What they told me was that uh, the Chef ecosystem for Windows felt stronger to them um, at the time. And again, see previous comment, innovations aren't frozen in time. But in my conversations with the folks at Chef, that's been reinforced through a lot of the increased volume in the, in the cookbooks that are available for Windows. Uh, so that's just that's one of those things. But you all have to do your own evaluations. You do have to look at these different things. All I'm saying here up on stage is, Let's, get, let's build some muscle in one of these things that can help you automate, right, and can get you to a consistent uh, delivery. Uh, they had 30 stacks that they wanted to manage and deploy, and many of them had to be done multiple times a day. This is a very agile and um, you know, dynamic type of an industry that they're in. So here's a little look at what, they, what they're building. So they were using the standard tools. I mean, this is the tools of the trade in the Windows world. They had Visual Studio, Team Foundation Server, and they chose Team City for their, for their build server, and they run that actually on EC2 instances that I'll show you here in a minute. Um, and, and they told me multiple times they did that because it had really great .NET support. Uh, they deploy IS Windows service apps, and they, they focused on securely reducing friction to continuous delivery. That was, their, that was their MO. That was what they wanted to try to achieve. Um, they stayed away from domain joins. They found ways to do security models that did not require it. You know, there's, there's a lot of different reasons why you might do it. This isn't, a, this isn't a statement of it's more secure or less secure. There's different ways to do secured connections to a database server. There's different ways to do secured connections to different web servers. You can use certificates. You can use username, password. Just be sure you're encrypting those passwords, right? You don't want things in clear text getting up on GitHub. Um, anything like that is just, just a nightmare. But, but they did not domain join things, and that gave them more, more agility. Uh, they used custom cookbooks to enforce tagging. And they did an interesting thing where they, they did a lot of isolation around the production AWS accounts. So from left to right, in the bottom corner here, you see the developer using Visual Studio. You see them committing. And they commit into Team Foundation Server. Then what they're doing is they're running with Opsworks, and they're using Team City to pull from Team Foundation Server using Git, right? Git is Git is Git, right? They can pull from Git. And then what they do is they actually roll into an auto-scaling group. Now, this is one of those things where they're missing a certain feature for scalable instance types inside of, of uh, Opsworks for Windows at the time. That won't, that won't be the case forever, but they had to come up with a pretty creative way to sort of add scaling instances um, with some of their bootstrapping code. Uh, so this sort of represents an example where they were doing this and repeating this over 30 different, 30 different stacks and deploying this regularly. So that's an example of a customer. Here's another one. It's very different. They didn't have quite so many. And I would actually say that's, 
very, this is very, the other one's very representative of a, of a, a lot of pushing of new versions of a code. This is actually more interesting from, a, from an operating perspective. This is a, an e-commerce web property that had to deal with uh, a lot of, of different sort of scenarios with following the sun. So infrastructure as code was fully adopted. They've been doing it for a while. Um, different teams took different, different tacks, different decisions. Uh, they, they were responsible, the DevOps team was responsible for all updates. They told me this a couple times. An update is anything that touches or changes that environment. It's not just code. It's a patch. It's a new, new third party uh, agent that needs to be installed. Everything that touches that environment would go through this process. So their solution was kind of a classic multi-tier web app data. And they had a single region deployment with multiple AZs. So there wasn't, there wasn't this thing going across multiple regions. Um, and they actually made use of Windows Active Directory and did domain join one tier of their architecture, and I'll show you it here in a second. So this is an example of the existing running environment. Um, it's actually, uh, you know, a load balancer on the front, a lot of web instances. So their elastic tier was up at the front, was taking the incoming web traffic. It told me that that was the tier they had to have a lot of elasticity on. That was the tier that when they were dealing with scalability and follow the sun, they needed to add instances and remove instances quick, right? They needed, they needed flexibility, so they avoided anything that caused them to have to do a reboot. So they'd bake the AMIs, they kept them off the domain, and when they connect through to their web application instances, which are web services, right? So it's a, it's a traditional kind of multi-tiered architecture. Those are actually are sitting on the domain because there's a requirement to do integrated security between the database servers and the application servers. Now, they didn't use RDS for the SQL Server. They're doing it on, on EC2. Uh, one of the things they did do is they did kind of that lollipop uh, VPC design, if you've heard of this, where you have a hub that hosts a lot of your central core assets, so things like your DNS services, and the, the, so they did bind, um, and the domain controllers. So they had uh, those things done centrally. And then what happens is over, over another peer connection, they'd use the Route 53 DNS kind of blue-green model where they would run them um, in a model where they could be either done in parallel or they would run them on-off if they had to deal with a schema change. So you might mentioned that's still a really challenging aspect and element and may cause you to take some downtime if you've got to change the schema and roll it all over and then resynchronize. And that's exactly what they're doing because over those peered connections between their UAT environment and their production environment, they do log shipping of the data, and then when they could flip it over, they would just have to take a, a momentary outage to sort of move things around, potentially, if there was significant schema changes in the, in the data tier. Uh, so peering was a big part of this solution, and you can see how they're able to sort of move things from left to right and leverage just core EC2. Uh, they did do cloud formation in here, obviously, uh, and then you know, this, was, this was definitely another different way in which they're doing significant Windows management. Okay, lessons learned across all these. I like this picture. No laughter for this one? All right, all right. All right, so it doesn't take as long as you think. I kind of said this, I mean, it, it, it was six months and they were into a mode where they were regularly and repetitively deploying across all those stacks multiple times a day. Um, these services are there. What's, what's stopping you from trying and experimenting and learning? I mean, if you aren't trying and failing, you're not learning and you're not getting better, you're not getting stronger, pick something, get good. Um, Dynamic tiers of your solution need to be lean and boot fast, especially things that you're adding or removing instances from regularly. It's critical that you treat everything as disposable. You cannot be, you know, and I get into this conversation from time to time where it's still sort of a little bit of a legacy mindset that I'm gonna name my EC2 instances, you know, um, some special names based on Star Wars characters, right? I don't, don't do that, right? These are, these are things that you should be getting rid of and, and adding in a really dynamic way. Uh, this was an interesting tip I found. They, they, they actually used this in a couple of occurrences where they, they needed more capacity and speed and power during the bootstrapping sequence, so much so that they started it up on a larger instance and could take the reboot to a smaller instance faster than running, say, on a, I don't know, a T2 medium for a web server that has a ton of bootstrapping code. This is, this is case specific. Like, you'd have to know how much of that was, was based off of what was being installed in the bootstrap. Uh, but just know that that's uh, an interesting strategy. And, and try to use the path of least resistance. If there's a, a supermarket that's got stuff that's perfect for you, start there. Go use those things. We got cloud formation templates that gives you a good head start into what's necessary as dependencies for your environment. Start there, right? Don't, don't reinvent the wheel. All right, quick summary. DevOps has no singular way. 
I showed you our services that AWS has. I showed you what, what Windows does. Um, I showed you a sample where you can actually go through and push the code all the way through to an instance from Visual Studio and GitHub. Uh, but there is no singular way. Just know about the patterns and start to find your path. Um, always remember the two sides of the coin. There's pushing code, there's operating code, and you've got to get good on both sides. Um, there's just a lot that comes into uh, making things get in, in a consistent and fast and iterative path. And last but not least, Windows Server can play a big part in your journey to AWS and your journey to the cloud. Uh, I know there's a legacy kind of um, maybe reputation that AWS doesn't have a lot for Windows, but I just showed you an hour of it, right? And these are, these are tools and, and, and techniques and, and concepts that, that I've seen from the time I've worked at Microsoft. I mean, there's lots of capabilities here. So please, well, first of all, thank you. Thank you for coming. Thank you for showing interest in this. Um, Remember to complete your evaluations. I do have five minutes for questions. We absolutely can take the questions out in the hallway after as well. Um, I'm here. Maybe find me at the party. We'll talk there. No. You should party at the party. Thank you. Thank you.